Okay, well, welcome everyone uh, to uh, uh, another installment of the, the CTMP series. Um, yeah, today uh, we, we uh, you know, we are hosting uh, Alexis Metz, who was, uh, was actually from uh, UCT. She did a, a master's here in the, the high energy uh, uh, theory. And uh, since I uh, moved down to uh, to Cambridge to do her, uh, are you doing your master's or PhD over there, Alexa? A PhD. She's doing a PhD in, uh, in Cambridge and uh, uh, is now uh, uh, moved on to a, uh, you know, a very adjacent field of archaeology. Um, in any case, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, today uh, 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 Alexis will be telling us uh, about uh, tracking movements. Uh, yeah, I'm, we're very excited to hear what you have to talk about, Alexis. Please, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, today I'm going to be talking about um, tracking movement and reconstructing regional geographic variation in cultural and transmission rates, which has implications for elucidating nuances and interactions between migrant populations and the incumbent communities that were already in a space between different subsistence strategies and between humans and their environment. And the context which I'm going to uh, show some of my analysis in is the sub-Saharan Eastern Stream Early Iron Age communities. Um, this work is based on my PhD, so it's very much a work in progress and um, any feedback or ideas is greatly, gratefully received. Uh, over the last few decades, um, archaeologists have built a body of work focusing on how fast people, ideas, cultural traits, or crops disseminate. And a large portion of these studies are simple regression analyses and conducted in a frequentist framework. Today, I'll be talking about new methods that can be used to track movements, and specifically, as I mentioned, in the context of the Bantu migration. The Bantu migrations were large-scale eastern and southern migrations throughout sub-Saharan Africa from about 4,000 to 1,500 years before present. There is convincing genetic, uh, linguistic, and archaeological evidence of an origin around here in northwest Cameroon called the Grasslands region. Um, and then uh, the migration spread throughout sub-Saharan Africa ending in, into southern Africa. This is arguably one of the most successful migrations in human history due to its spatial scale, speed, and longitudinal orientation. Uh, over a few thousand years, the Bantu-speaking people proliferated over 9 million square kilometers to become one of the largest language groups in Africa today. There are currently around 600 Bantu languages uh, spoken by 350 million people. Major economic and cultural changes took place over Sub-Saharan Africa during this time. The dispersal is associated with a Bantu cultural package consisting wholly or in part at various times of a more sedentary lifestyle, uh, thick walled pottery, iron metallurgy, and you can see an example here in the right uh, of an um, anthropomorphic low um, iron smelting furnace from Nyanga in eastern Zimbabwe. And you can see indications of fertility symbols, uh, which was quite typical of a Bantu speaking people in this region. But also in the package is cattle keeping and crop cultivation. There are linguistic evidence uh, indicating that phonio, pearl, and cowpea were introduced and utilized by Bantu speaking people. In this talk, I'm going to consider movement in the framework of four questions. Why do people move? What is actually moving? Where are they going and when did they get there? And what factors are affecting the movement? So we consider the first question, why do people move? And it's predominantly a need-driven argument. The domestication of important African crops suggests that agricultural innovations played a role in the Bantu language spread. This is evident in many early farming communities. There's a Neolithic demographic transition, or NDT, which have likely provided the impetus for Bantu-speaking people to seek new land. 
once they had transitioned into adopting food producing strategies, they would have undergone a population growth. And this population growth would have put pressure on the environment and provided the momentum for them to go forth and um, find new resources. But there are other reasons that could have compounded this momentum, such as ecological drivers, or as uh, Jan van Sina suggests, uh, that subgroups might have been spurred by the desire for independence and prestige, or otherwise known as rank enhancement. So small groups breaking off from an original group to go into a new area such that um, the subgroups can then have their own chiefs and new leaders. So if we go further into considering what is actually moving, as in all large scale human dispersals, there's a body of literature seeking to categorize this movic movement as demic diffusion, cultural diffusion, or combinations thereof. And linguistic, genetic, and archeological evidence all play a part in helping us to understand the Bantu expansion, which is one of the reasons why I chose this phenomena to work on the, on the archeological side, because it's fascinating to be able to uh, cross pollinate and look at what the other types of evidence in these other fields are telling us. So what emerges are complex pictures of movement. And I've just, as an example, put on the screen a few uh, papers of um, archeologists, linguists, and geneticists that have all weighed in on this debate. We must remember that the Bantu expansion is a language dispersal. And the latest research by linguists and geneticists agree that it was a demic expansion. But there's a lot of support that language and farming dispersed simultaneously in the later stages. So in the archaeological record, what we're left with is material remains of cultural traces. And there was a specific paper by Boyd et al. in 1996 called Are Cultural Phylogenies Possible? which was fundamental in shaping my understanding of how culture is transmitted. In trying to answer the question, what is actually moving? Fundamentally, what we're asking ourselves is what elements of the culture moved? Did some traits move with others? And were these traits grouped to form packages of traits at different times? And did these packages change uh, temporally? Ultimately, for analysis purposes, we also have to ask, can we isolate these traits in the archaeological record? Uh, Boyd et al. state the existence of only one deep element, such as language, cannot alone be used to infer the existence of a full core of shared traditions among cultures related by language only. As an example of this, uh, Jan van Sina uh, conducted a comprehensive study in 1990 of political traditions in equatorial Africa. And it consisted of a controlled comparison of about 200 distinct societies in the basin of the Zaire River through successive splits, migrations, and expansions, widely differing societies arose out of a single ancestral tradition by major transformations. So what he's saying is that all these cultures have, have the same uh, language or the same language subgroup. They could all roughly be classed as um, Bantu speaking, and they come from a similar place, but all these different splits and transformations, you end up with variations in these societies that include two kinds of segmentary lineage societies, four kinds of associations, five different kinds of chiefdoms. So you have people organizing themselves in very different ways. He argues that change can occur through outside influences. For example, in these areas, we had the new inhabitants, the Bantu speaking subgroup people moving into the area, but you also had autochronous hunter gatherers, non-Bantu people, uh, you had pastoralists, and all these people have different legacies, and each of these legacies come together to influence developments of ancestral traditions. Um, as he also repeatedly shows, the change was not only outside influences, what was in the environment when people arrived, there were also these in continuous internal innovations, how people chose to, uh, to align themselves, how they chose to uh, enact different subsistence strategies in their particular region. So when we're talking broadly of a cultural package, we have to understand that it might look very different in different areas. And for that reason, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense to try to put a statistical model on the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. 
in order to try to address this slightly and move towards a more cohesive cultural package, I've na narrowed my study region to Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, and looking specifically at early Iron Age communities, as there's evidence that by, by the time uh, Bantu-speaking people reached the Great Lakes region of Eastern Africa, they had um, iron metallurgy. So this is the study area that I'm going to be focusing on today. It consists of 923 dates over 301 sites in 13 countries. And I realized that that might not sound like a lot coming from physics, but in archaeology, that's considered quite a quite a big data set. I have made use of the SARD, Southern African Radiocarbon Database for Southern Africa, and that, that's uh, these radiocarbon dates here in blue. And I supplemented this with an additional 427 collected dates from 158 sites in Eastern Africa. These dates were collated from various journals spanning the 1960s to the present day, such as the African Archaeological Review, Azania, the Journal of African History, uh, and Yama Akuma. Um, and while I, why I mention this is because it's actually one of the first major outcomes of my research that until now, there has been no current high quality unaggregated databases for Iron Age radiocarbon dates in Eastern Africa. And uh, my collected database will be shared and made publicly available so that other people can do all sorts of analysis that they want into the future. So in section three of the tracking movement framework, I'm gonna focus on analyzing our the archaeological data set that I've just described. However, applications or statistical models implemented on archaeological data aren't as straightforward as they might appear. So before continuing it, it behoves us to digress into common issues with archaeological data, as some of these are quite unique to the field and pose quite interesting mathematical problems. So let's sidebar. Um, why isn't this easy? Firstly, some terminology to describe the different aspects of data quality. Uh, there are four that describe the properties of the analytical units that make up the data set, as well as the relationship between these units. We have scope, which is the total amount of time and space that is encompassed in a data set uh, with the spatial and temporal width of the observation window. There is sampling interval, which is the interval of time and space between each analytical unit. The resolution, which is the amount of time and space that's represented within each analytical unit, or the extent of time and space averaging, and the trend, which refers to the intensity of the force as you go back in time from the youngest proportion of the archaeological record to the oldest. So on the left, we have a temporal demonstration uh, of a data set which comprises a series of cultural levels at a stratified site. And on the right, we have an archaeological site with three concentrations of lithic artifacts as a spatial example of what the different aspects of the data quality look like. So there are two broad categories affecting the quality of the archaeological record, the loss of archaeological data and the mixing of archaeological data. Both of these issues massively constrict the scale at which we're able to ask and answer questions concerning the material record of our past. And there's a very interesting book that delves into these issues in a lot of detail by Charles Perrault, The Quality of the Archaeological Record. And if you're interested in uh, mathematically uh, defining the, the scale at which we can answer questions about the past, it's a very interesting book to read. I thought I would give a quick summary here, as that might be illuminating in going into what I actually work on later on in the talk. So beginning with the loss of archaeological data, in 1995, no, 1975, sorry, 1975, Michael Collins identified a series of sampling biases that affect the archaeological record, and he laid them out in a hierarchical structure. We could go through them quickly. Number one is not all behavior results in patterned material culture. Of those that do, not all can enter the archeological record. Of those that do, not all will enter the archeological record. Of those that do, not all will be preserved. 
And of those that do, not all will survive indefinitely. So we have our first five biases here, and they all tend to lead to preservation loss. We can perform a quick preservation loss simulation to look at that. Uh, a taphonomic loss leads to frequency distribution of archaeological sites that decrease through time. If we created a simulation where 100 sites were created every year and the sites were destroyed with a given probability, um, the, the rate of the taphonomic loss uh, rho varies with site HT. And this probability model was proposed by Saravel et al. in 2009 as a model that best explains terrestrial volcanic temporal frequency distribution. Uh, and we can use this because terrestrial records show that volcanic activity increases exponentially uh, quite in the same way that radiocarbon dates do. So we take their model, and if we generate 40 million sites over 40,000 years, only 9.5% of those sites will survive. So the vast majority of archaeological... Sorry. Is someone speaking? It's background noise. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Um, the vast majority of sites are lost due to preservation loss. Preservation loss uh, also leads in archaeological data to what's become known as the signal lips effect. Cultural change can be abrupt. Ways of life abandoned after an environmental crisis such as a drought, a societal collapse, demographic crash, or an origination event where we have a sudden appearance of several new traditions, such as the domestication of rice and what that would lead to. But the preservation loss of the archaeological record makes sudden cultural change appear gradual. Uh, it was Signer and Lips's 1982 work that recognized that the sudden extinction of multiple taxa will appear in the fossil record as a smeared out sequential series of extinctions because of incomplete preservation. And you can see this on the figure on the right. Uh, the traits disappeared all at the same time during, due to this boundary event, but most abundant and preservable traits will persist archaeologically closest to the boundary events, while as others will disappear before, depending on their abundance and preservability. Errors in the estimation of the times of disappearance of various traits will result in this apparent gradual disappearance, where what we can see in archaeological record is that these five traits all seem to have disappeared at different times. Continuing with the biases that cause the loss of archaeological data, at number six, we have of those that do, not all will be exposed by archaeologists. And at number seven, of those that do, not all will be identified or recognized by archaeologists. The last two are biases that lead to observational loss. Which comes to my favorite joke in archaeology. It hangs on one of the walls in our departments, uh, that if you don't know what it is, it's probably ceremonial. So besides all the sites that we lose, when we have a site, we might not be identifying it correctly. And the joke plays on the, the fact that um, we have a tendency to ascribe things ritualistic or ceremonial value when it in reality might not be. So moving on to the mixing of archaeological data. Mixing is caused by depositional processes, by disturbance processes or analytical lumping, which is when archeologists lump together archeological information in order to create analytical units so that they can perform their analyses. And in the center of the page, we have a example of a disturbance process. Um, at T1, we have two, two different discrete horizons of cultural artifacts. At time two, expansion and contraction of the clay matrix causes an upward movement of these artifacts. In time three, the artifacts tend to fall into the cracks. And at time four, when the clay becomes sealed again, uh, we have an homogenized cultural debris where we've lost the fact that we originally started with two distinct layers. The primary effect uh, of, mi of the mixing of archaeological data is to decrease the temporal and spatial resolution by making activities that took place at different points in space and time to all be occurring together. But there are other effects, such as mixing skews relative frequencies, mixing influences richness, which is the number of types or classes, mixing increases variance, and mixing confounds associations and correlations. 
We can deep dive into any one of these effects, but in the interest of time, I'm going to look mathematically at teasing out how the mixing of archaeological data increases the variance of the assemblage. So mixing collapses variance that exists within contexts into the variance that exists between contexts. Variance inflation is a, of a, in a mixed assemblage is a function of the overall dispersion of the mean over the period of mixing, rather than how much the mean of a trait changed between contexts. That means a trait that oscillates rapidly, but within a narrow range of values, will not inflate variance of a mixed assemblage to the same extent as a trait that evolves more slowly over a larger range. We can see this um, in the figures on the right, how temporal mixing increases the variance in both context A, where there is a linear change in the mean, and context B, where there's a, where there's a fluctuating mean. So we can quantify the effect of mixing on the variance of the assemblage by deriving the expected variance among the means. Imagine a continuous archaeological trait that is normally distributed, for example, vessel size, say uh, x. The mean of the trait x changes over time, but its variance remains stable, as we saw in the figures, uh, in the figures on the previous page. The mean of the archaeological trait x is the sum of two variables, a and p, where uh, a is drawn from the population of means and p is drawn from the deviation uh, from the group mean. If A and P are uncorrelated, as they are in the case of the normal distribution, the variance of trait Vx is the sum of the variance among the means and the population variance Vp. So when the distribution of the trait is temporally autocorrelated, which can arise for multiple reasons in the archaeological record, including social transmission, stylistic drift, or environmental constraints, we can assume a Markovian process. Um, this means that the distribution of the mean trait at time t depends on the distribution of the preceding time t minus 1, plus an incremental amount drawn from the random distribution of transitions or steps, which we'll call epsilon. Um, epsilon has a mean mu step and a variance sigma step. So the variance of A is just defined in equation 2 over there. And if we substitute equation one into equation two, we have equation three, where we've recognized that the population mean at time i can be expressed as the sum of all evolutionary steps from one to i. And for uh, general simplification purposes, we assumed the initial value of zero at time zero, as we always tend to do. Um, Okay, so now the expectation of an arbitrary function of a vector of variables f y can be approximated using a Taylor series expansion about its expectation. And we have in equation four, we have up to the second order terms. In our present application, our function f is the variance of a, so equation three. And the vector of variables is all the evolutionary steps epsilon from time one to t. So we wish to calculate equation four, and the first term is the function evaluated at the mean value for all variables. The second term contains the variance of the ith variable. The third term includes the covariance between the ith and jth variable. And the second derivatives in the second and third term are all evaluated at the expectation mean for each variable. So under our simple Markovian model, each step or transition is independently and identically drawn. And thus the covariance between all pairs of steps is equal to zero and this third term vanishes. So now we have a simplified equation for consisting of term one and term two. I'm going to focus on calculating each of those separately and then put them together and see what that tells us about how the variance changes in mixed archaeological assemblages. So first, I've just, just to remind us, put equation three and four at the top of the screen. And um, then since the calculated, it's focusing on calculating the first term, since the function we consider is the mean variance VA, as we said, and um, we are, this is given by equation three, the first term of the equation four can simply be written out as equation five, remembering that in our random walk model, each step epsilon i has a mean mu step and a variance equal to sigma squared step. So there's no black magic happening there. 
um, we could simplify this because the sum of mu steps from one to i is simply equal to i multiplied by mu step, and we get equation six. Solving the finite sums and simplified, we're left with equation seven. So that was pretty easy. Then the second term, uh, we have the taking the second derivative of equation three gives equation eight. We can sum over the second derivatives of epsilon i and simplify, and we get equation nine. And so we can write out the second term of equation four as equation 10. So putting in term one and term two, which we calculated, we can write out equation four now to have the form shown on the screen as equation 11. We should Remember that the expression was derived using only second order terms of the Taylor series. But if we notice in equation eight, uh, none of these terms are dependent on epsilon i. And as a result, all subsequent derivatives which re with respect to epsilon i will be equal to zero. So all third order and higher terms in the Taylor series will be equal to zero. And equation 11 is exact. Uh, in taking the limit when the number of time steps is large yields equation 12. And so this is the equation that we're left with. And it partitions the variance inflation into a term dependent on the directionality of change and into a term dependent on unbiased changes. So clearly the directionality of change is a more potent driver of variance inflation than unbiased changes. And in the archeological record, what that means is that the problem of variance inflation is particularly acute during periods in which a trait is evolving in a systematic manner. So when we have projectile points on our arrowheads systematically becoming smaller as years increase. In contrast, traits that do not evolve in one particular direction, either because they're neutral or because they're bound by some sort of functional constraint, such as the shape of a human hand constricts hand act shapes. They physically can't get any bigger um, because we wouldn't be able to hold them. These types of changes are more robust against the fix of effects of mixing. So we could, uh, if we wanted to be here for longer than I assume you do want to be here on Friday afternoon, derive the effects of uh, mixing on the correlation of time average samples. Um, and that is also an interesting mathematical derivation, but I think we should probably save that one for a rainy day uh, and move on to some of my analyses. But before we do that, here is a table which just gives a summary of all of the various forces which affect different aspects of the quality of archaeological data. For example, we have analytical, analytical lumping over here, which has the effect of decreasing the resolution of the data. Some of these factors are very difficult to take into consideration. Some of them we can mathematically quantify. Um, but employing statistical methods to quantify and account for these uncertainties in the data is part of what I work on. So progressing onto the question that I have been working on for the last few months, where are they going and when did they get there? So to look at how fast the dispersal is, one can do a really simple regression analysis. And uh, in the with radiocarbon dates, what that means is that the rate of spread is the slope of the straight line fits into the relationship between the distance from a putative origin and the radiocarbon age of the site at each sample. They have a very long history in archaeology, beginning with the pioneering work of Edmondson in the 1960s, who used the earliest occurrences of pottery, copper, and maize to determine the rate of diffusion of Neolithic conditions, as vague as that term may be globally. Uh, but these analyses didn't take measurement uncertainty into account. They had, as you can see, an example of hand-drawn plots, no consideration to sample size, very vague definition of what was being measured and were conducted into a frequentist framework. So we've come a long way since then, and I hope to be able to show this to you. So the very first step in my analysis was to obtain a global dispersal rate uh, with a simple Bayesian regression model. Uh, 
this was done to remind you for the eastern stream of the sub-Saharan early Iron Age communities. Uh, there's a very simple regression framework, but there are a few adaptions for the archaeological context, so I thought I would walk through it briefly. So the negative sign in equation one accounts for the convention here, that time is measured on a positive BP or before present scale. The dates are calibrated using intercal 20 or SHCal20, depending whether or not you find a radiocarbon date above or below the equator. And uh, measurement uncertainty is taken into account. The sigma, here yeah, sigma i, is the square root of the sum of the squares of the error on the calibration curve and the sample C14H error, which leads us to the observed radiocarbon age of the sample uh, with uncertainty included, which is given by XI. Now, the ordinary linear regression model on the previous page calculates the distribution of mean arrival dates. We can replace this with a quantile regression to examine the dispersal rate from the earliest arrival dates. And this amounts to updating equation two, uh, such that the true calendar dates, um, which is given here by theta i, are now modeled using an asymmetric Laplace likelihood where lambda is the scale parameter and tau is the specified quantile of interest. And this updating takes place because U et al. in his 2001 paper, the links at the bottom, showed that the pth regression quantile defined as the solution to the quantile regression minimization problem is mathematically equivalent to the maximization of the likelihood function of an asymmetric Laplace densities, which are independently distributed. So as a reminder of our sample region, we have Eastern and Southern Africa, about 900 dates, 300 sites, I'm taking for the regression analysis an uh, origin around Great Lakes region, Kataruka. And previous studies into dispersal rates in this region include in the last 10 years, Isen et al. and Russell et al. studies into how fast the Bantu spread occurred. There are some limitations of these studies, the one being that the analysis were completed, completed with far fewer radiocarbon dates, and here we're talking, I think, below 100. Uh, the regression was frequentist. It used median calibrated dates, so there wasn't, the, the equations I showed you where we were taking the error into consideration wasn't included. Um, and it, so it didn't account for the impact of the measurement error, nor the non-random effects of these errors due to calibration effects. Uh, we take those equations, one, two, and three, and we do a MCMC analysis. We set up our priors where they are roughly informed by the archaeological record. Beta zero is uh, informed by the assumption that the first Bantu migration in the Great Lakes region occurred somewhere between 2,600 BP and 2,400 BP. Tau is set to 0 0.9 as the 90th percentile is more robust to the effects of outliers than the 99th. And the prior for the slope parameter, beta 1, is weakly informed by example known examples of agricultural dispersals. The MCMC is implemented using nimble and nimble carbon packages in R to obtain posterior estimates of our model parameters, beta 0, beta 1, and lambda. I'm not sure this would be of much interest, but the MCMC settings were 2 million iterations, half dedicated to burn-in, four chains, and you can see the trace plots on the right showing good convergence. The parameters sampled every 100 steps, and the, there was a Metropolis Hastings adaptive random walk sampler. Very briefly, we have some regression results. Uh, on the left, the, there's the overall quantile regression model fitted on the median calibrated dates. That's the blue line over here. And there's a 95% confidence interval. The overall Bayesian quantile regression is the red line here. And also plotted are the median calibrated dates, which are the hollow circles, and the Bayesian models median posterior estimates, which are the solid circles. So your Bayesian model simultaneously estimates the dispersal rate and the calendar date of each sample, taking these measurement uncertainties into account. Uh, Sometimes the model's posterior estimates, so the solid dots, differ from the median calibrated radiocarbon dates, the hollow circles. And in these cases, you can see the you can see the offset as these vertical, vertical dashed lines. Here, the model is providing 
a high amount of additional information, effectively correcting these outlier dates to have occurred later in time, or rather understanding the early Iron Age communities to have reached a site later than the radiocarbon dates suggest. On the right, there's the reciprocal of the posterior distribution of uh, the parameter beta one, which gives the global dispersal rate. And it is observed that this is between 7.8 and 14.2 kilometers a year. That's really very fast, um, uncomfortably fast. I would not like to stand up in a room of archeologists and say that the, the Eastern um, early Iron Age community spread happened at that rate. And one of the reasons that we get such a uh, dramatic answer, I believe is, is due to the limitations of the model that we're providing one, one global value to encompass a series of smaller or localized dispersals. So it's very, it's very unsatisfactory. The, in general, the, the method has several limitations that the analysis is sensitive to how the center of diffusion or spread is defined. Often we don't know where a trait originated from. We have the rough area, such as the entire Bunt expansion, we roughly believe started in the grasslands region, but you can't pinpoint the exact, um, the exact place where it occurred. It's dependent on how one selects your local sample size. Um, I've spoken about the third one. Typically, people ignored measurement uncertainty. But the most dramatic is this, this fourth point that we have a single dispersal rate, which is generalizing movement dynamics to a point that's fairly meaningless. Now, if we wanted to move into looking at local dispersal rates, we can allow, uh, there are ways to do that. For example, through introducing a Gaussian process adaption which it captures local variation in the tempo, tempo of the dispersal process at each site. This would be equivalent to replacing equation one, which you can see on the left, with these three equations. Uh, SI is a local deviation parameter, which is introduced to allow for site level variation. It's modeled as a multivariate normal with a mean of zero and a quadratic exponential model defining the covariance matrix. So for site N and M, uh, D would be the great arc distance between the two sites. Uh, the parameter rho here describes the extent of spatial autocorrelation. Rho is large when a clustering effect in the data is observed. So when there are big regions where the dispersal state rate is kind of similar in each region, we have the square of the marginal deviation parameter eta, which defines the maximum covariance. And while eta squared, when it is large, it translates into a larger variation in the dispersal rate. The identity matrix in the second term ensures an additional covariance when uh, n is equal to m. And the rest of the equations, how we take measurement uncertainty into account, et cetera, the fact that it's a quantile regression, these all stay the same. You can see that at the bottom page. So I did do that, beginning with a tactical simulation in a in a fake world, this world is called rabbit world, you generate some archeological data. So you know the underlying parameters and then you test out the Gaussian process uh, quantile regression or GPQR to see whether the statistical model can uncover the, the true parameters that you used, the underlying that you used to generate the data. Uh, here are some brief results. We can see there were around 30 sites. Um, and mainly in the Northwest, we have a dispersal rate between like 0 0.5 kilometers a year, and it gets faster as you go to the, the Southeast. The rate of dispersal is now given by uh, minus one over the deviation parameter minus the slope. But the problem with GPQR is that it's computationally very heavy running this because of the calibration and uncertainty and everything, all this baggage that, that comes with each radiocarbon date. Um, this took, I don't know, maybe like four or five days on a, on a virtual machine, like 96 cores and 128 gigs of RAM. And in our case, we have 10 times as many sites. So we have 300 sites and it's just not, feasible to every time you want to adjust a parameter or tweak something, 
to then rerun a calculation that's going to take three weeks to do so. It's also not good reproducible research because nobody can check up or run the results themselves. So we're still on question three um, of the tracking movement framework. Where are they going and when did they get there? But I think it helps us to stop with where are we going now? Because the flip side of looking at how fast movement occurred is to look at when something arrived. So what we want to do is have localized dynamics, but ran into computational problems with trying to find the localized dynamics when we looked at how fast movement occurred. So now focusing on when something arrived, uh, the first thing that one can do is look at Bayesian phase models, which have been used to estimate local arrival times. We can then introduce a hierarchical structure to take sample interdependence into account. And going further, and this is this is a new adaption that, as far as I'm aware, nobody has quite used uh, statistical models in this way to solve this type of archaeological problem yet, is to introduce Bayesian intrinsic conditional auto autoregressive models, or ICARs, to allow information sharing among neighboring areas, which is particularly useful when we have regions uh, where no sites are present in a given area. And have no fear, I'm going to go into explaining the figure on the right as we build it up successively in the remainder of this talk. Now, Bayesian phase models have been used in archaeology to chronologically delineate cultural phases, estimate the arrival of cultural traits or crops, or model migration arrival times. Here, we use them to estimate the arrival of the EIA cultural package in Eastern and Southern Africa. In case you forgot, that's what we're focusing on. There are advantages, um, such as the ability to count for localized dynamics, and that, that's really what we're after. Um, but the second advantage is that it is not sensitive to how the origin is defined. You don't you don't build in the assumption of where you think the origin would be into your model. So a Bayesian phase model can be expressed as follows. Uh, the basic principle is that your true calendar date here, theta i k. Uh, so true calendar date theta i in region k is modeled as a uniform distribution bounded by the arrival time a k and the end date b k. And uh, the measurement error of theta i k is accounted for in the same way as the regression models earlier. I haven't shown them here just for the sake of not cluttering up the screen. There are limitations such as there's a sensitivity to how we define spatial regions. But more than that, uneven sampling leads to some sites contributing multiple dates and the interdependence of these dates biases your arrival estimation. A solution to the latter problem is to introduce a hierarchical structure. So if we look at our data, we do indeed have an uneven sampling. We have 124 sites contributing one radiocarbon day each, and over here, we have one site which has 26 dates associated with it. So in order to solve this, we want to look at hierarchical Bayesian phase models. Uh, they, the basic structure is that we consider arrival times within each site J before we aggregate up and look at the larger region uh, K. We see AK remains the overall arrival time in region K, BK remains the overall end date in region K, but we've introduced this new variable, alpha JK, uh, which is the arrival time of the phenomena at site J in region K, while the end, the duration of occupation is delta JK, and the end date would then just be alpha plus uh, delta. But we don't really care about this uh, duration parameter. We're, we're, mo we're focused on the arrival of a cultural phenomena in an area. So we're focusing on um, alpha JK, but to a larger extent, AK, the arrival in the region, not the arrival in the site. So we can do a tactile simulation similar to how um, I showed you Rabbit World earlier, just to see which model is better at uncovering our true parameters. I did the non-hierarchical Bayesian phase model and the hierarchical Bayesian phase model. And you can see that the non-hierarchical model is more precise. We have a narrower posterior, 
but that the hierarchical model is uh, better able to recover the true parameters A and B, so it is more accurate. And as such, we're going to be using the hierarchical model. Our study area, we are faced with the question as to how to split that up. And it is what is known as the minimal aerial unit problem or MORP in um, geography, which describes the issue whereby summary statistics aggregate over defined unit areas are dependent on the shape and scale of the aggregation unit. We have the 13 countries which make up Eastern and Southern Africa uh, given, on the, given on the left. And I've chosen to uh, split this into 41 hexagonal areas. Um, in the, the issue is that if the areas are too large, spatial aggregation mean that important local variations in the parameter of interest are missed. But if you have it too small, then you have too few samples in each region and there's a much larger uncertainty in, it, in the estimated parameters. So I chose the hexagonal area size at the threshold at which decreasing the spatial units stops yielding a greater proportion of sites with site information. So you aren't gaining anything by making the area smaller. You actually start to lose information again. So there's, there's a tipping point. Um, and that turned out in this case to be 41 spatial areas. So here are the results of the Bayesian hierarchical phase model. And there are some things which are good and some things which are not so good. So I will walk you through them. The, we have that the model identifying correctly that in the Great Lakes region, roughly around here, we have an earliest arrival time. So this wasn't this wasn't an assumption built into our model again, but we've seen that it can pick up that it's likely that Bantu speaking people arrived in this region first. We also see a sort of wave in advance. We have earlier arrival times um, as, sorry, later and later arrival times as you go down into Southern Africa. But there are some issues. Uh, the, the model has the arrival into Southern Africa here at 1,200 years before present. That is very early, too, too early, um, uncomfortably early. But <laughs> the, the major problem is these areas which I have grayed out. These are spatial regions where we don't have any site information. It, it so happened uh, in that uneven sampling um, record that we have, we don't have any radio sites generating radiocarbon dates in these areas. And as you can see, they correspond to posterior estimates given on the right here. And I will highlight them. So five, seven, 12, uh, these are our areas that the posteriors are very broad. The model literally has no idea what to estimate in those areas. And if you, if you if you put back what the model thinks is happening, it's just kind of given you such a large uncertainty to be entirely nonsensical. But we don't need to stop there because People entering a regional area must have come from somewhere and must be going somewhere else. So the, the information, although we have no information in a region, we should be able to use the information of our neighbors to inform what's going on in our regions without information. So this, was, this is what has led me to look into Bayesian uh, intrinsic conditional autoregressive models or uh, ICON. And it has a very similar structure to the way we set up our phase models, but basically we've replaced our arrival times. We're modeling it as the uh, a decar normal or uh, the improper Gaussian conditional um, autoregressive distribution. And we have as inputs, this is the adjacent location of your neighbors. So. In a region K, we're looking at the neighbors that surround that region. And these are the adjacent locations of those neighbors. It's a, a sparse representation of a, the full adjacency matrix. Uh, this will be your weights of unnormalized weights. This is a vector giving the number of neighbors of each spatial location. So go back. This 
uh, hexag hexagon here has one, two, three, four neighbors, but a hexagon here right in the middle of the sample size will have six neighbors. And tau is the scalar position of the uh, Gaussian car prior. So these are the results that we get, and they're much more satisfactory, I'm pleased to say. We have, all of a sudden, we have the areas that don't have site information, and I've highlighted them, hopefully, are still getting uh, posteriors, which are some sort of estimates of what's happening in that region. So the the model is able to say something about what we think the arrival time in those regions is going to be based on what's happening uh, in, in areas where we know the information is coming from. We also see um, a more reasonable arrival time into the Great Lakes region uh, slightly later, but it's still it's interesting that the model still picks up that we believe this to be um, to be the origin of the the eastern uh, Bantu stream. Uh, Bantu, Bantu stream. Uh, we're still getting some similar dynamics, which are, will be interesting to look into in greater detail archaeologically. For example, when the arrival time happens around here, they seem to choose an interior route going Zambia, Zimbabwe, rather than Mozambique coast. Slightly later arrival time of there. And we have a much more realistic arrival time to Southern Africa uh, down here. One of the things I wanted to point out, which is interesting in how uh, ICAR models share information among neighbors, is that most of these areas have a wider posterior, so the model's less certain than, for example, in areas where there are many radiocarbon dates. And the exception would be area 29. And you can see here that area 29's posterior estimation is kind of similar looking to 28, 27, where we have information. And the reason for that is all the other areas where we didn't have information are all on the edge of our sampling size. So 21 can only gain information from two neighbors. Uh, 40 can gain information from three neighbors. Whereas 29 is the only uh, area in our sample size which can gain information from six neighbors all around it. So the fact that it can share from six different sources means that the model is able, more able to give us information as to its arrival time and the posterior estimate, as you see on the right, is narrower. There are other ways which we can visualize this, such as a probability matrix. Um, that just helpful for visualization purposes tells us simple things like there is a 0 0.24 probability that area seven is earlier than area eight, but there's a 84% probability that area that they that Bantu speaking people arrived in area 11 over area 12. So that is a helpful way to visualize data. And finally, the the things I've been working on most recently and very much a work in progress, is to then look at the direction of movement. So if you do a, a Dynani triangulation of the centroids of each of your spatial areas, you have 110 transitions in 41 hexagonal areas. And uh, you can look along these transitions. You can take the arrival time at node one and the arrival time at node two, divide by the distance, and you get sort of um, an inverse of speed, some sort of indication as to the certainty, how certain we are that movement occurred. Uh, yeah, that that's very optimistic, the gradient surface of arrival times. Maybe it would be better to say that's what I intend to move towards is creating a gradient surface of arrival times. This is very preliminary, but it enables us to see the region where regional accelerations and decelerations are observed. Remembering that this is a Bayesian framework, not frequentist, so it's kind of difficult to depict point estimates, um, but what we have is the magnitude of the arrows showing us the the strength of this um, of, of the movement in that direction and how opaque the arrows are show us the the uncertainty or certainty that 
we we think that the movement occurred in that direction and not in the opposite direction, like from node two to one versus one to two. So finally, we're on to uh, what factors are affecting movement. And this is the next stage of my research in that we need more of a narrative of change and continuity. We need to be looking at how interaction played out when movement occurred. We have Bantu speaking people moving into areas where autochthonous hunter-gatherers already existed, where uh, pastoral herders existed. And it is interesting to know how did the existing populations influence how uh, Bantu people moved around the landscape. What's also interesting is if humans overcome or whether they're di directed by ecological conditions. So we can add in the ecological factors as covariates and see to what extent can they explain the movement that's that's coming out of our statistical models. So in conclusion, we have looked at all the various complexities around movement in the past. And by understanding uh, the statistical movements and reasons for why these local movements might occur and how they occur, it could have implications for elucidating how and why humans might move in the future. Um, we've looked at phase models, which allowed for the localized complexities in arrival times. Um, the ICAR model offers an improvement of phase models. I hope I've been able to convince you of that in such that they're able to bound uh, regions where we had few radio accommodates or absolutely no radio accommodates. And this is very important for Africa where issues on funding or colonial legacies have meant that some countries have many archeological sites and we have many radio carbon dates generated from each site, uh, such as Zambia and Zimbabwe are very well covered. But if you go into Angola, and this is for example, if you were looking at the, the Western Bantu stream, so different to what we were doing today, I think there are two radio carbon dates in the whole of Angola that are associated with Iron Age uh, remains. So you would have vast regions of space that don't have any information on it. And to be able to say anything, even if we've just bounded those regions by information concerning a region above that or below that uh, is helpful. We see from our model, we saw strong evidence of um, earliest uh, EIA arrival in the Great Lakes region. And it was very comforting that in all cases, the model identified that region as uh, likely being uh, early arrival because that lines up well with uh, local archeologists working on the ground, what they're saying. The arrival in Southern Africa to be around 1,600 years before present. And the next steps, as I mentioned, is to look at ecological drivers to explain these movement frictions. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that this was somewhat entertaining. I know it's quite different to some of the, the high energy physics talks normally given on a Friday. And I, uh, yeah, I'm available for any questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that nice talk, uh, Alexia. This was uh, not, uh, not really not, not, not the usual for us over here. But, uh, okay. <laughs> so, I'm sure uh, there's some uh, questions in the room. Uh, uh, please go ahead. Oh, Daniel? Uh, I have on the Bayesian uh, ICAR model that you were using to estimate the arrival times, you yes. said that there was a when you actually looked at the sort of path that people were taking, they were following the interior as opposed to the coast. Do you think that's being affected by the coast, I want to say tiles, the, the coast the hexagons not having neighbors and or having fewer neighbors and having a sort of worse estimate or would that not affect it? Well, from the way in which I, I, I still need to look um, at, at exactly how much information uh, sharing amongst neighbors is occurring. But the way in which I understand it is that it's only in the cases where you need to borrow information from your neighbors to uh, inform your arrival time that you do so. So if, if your arrival, if your hexagonal region has 
a lot of radiocarbon dates in that region, and they're all providing information as to when you think arrival occurred in that region. The model is going to pay attention to that. The model is going to concentrate in uh, using that to provide the posterior estimate. Um, and it's, it's only in regions that we, we don't have information, uh, these ones here. So, so in this region, which is, I think, I, I can't remember what the number was, but let's call it 20, 27 or something. So in, oh, my point is not on. Yeah, in the, this region 27, which I think is maybe what you were you were talking about, we do have radiocarbon dates in that area. So it's not, it's not simply that uh, there are less, there are less neighbors here. It's more important that we have archeological information and we're still seeing that trend come up. Um, it could be the case that we, that information sharing favors, um, as we've seen that when we don't have information, information sharing favors uh, more uh, precise posterior estimates, so narrower posteriors in regions such as 29, which have more neighbors, but that would only affect it if we had an area on the coast without information. Um, and not areas on the coast where we do have information and still see the same trend. Okay. Well, yes, please. Um, Alexis, there are a few of us here from the archaeology department. So this is an archaeological question rather than a, um, a sort of maths question. But I, I'm listen to you talk and I'm thinking that when people talk about this expansion they typically think of it as a terrestrial phenomenon. We know that these people were coming from a region of East Africa where people had been traveling around in boats for probably several millennia before the start of this expansion. Do you think that um, or are you taking into consideration the possibility that there might have been a, a coastal maritime component to this expansion? That's uh, certainly a very interest, interesting avenue. And um, it is not one, the model doesn't rule it out. The If, if for example, here yeah, the model is saying arrival occurred at that time, and some of these things um, will, some of these, these uh, numbers, the actual arrival dates, uh, will change as we uh, adapt the model. It's still in its early stages, but it, it's not It's not forcing movement to have occurred via a specific route. So it's not saying they came from region here into this region. They it, it doesn't it doesn't prohibit the fact that movement could have occurred along the coast. And it's certainly very interesting to look at the different ways that movement could could occur and um, could uh, uh, could play out the, the different modes of transport. Just as uh, just to be clear that the coast is here, but the map is kind of confusing. The, the coast is not all along on the side for the people that aren't archaeologically uh, focused. Um, this is the this is the interior of the rest of Africa, and the coast is on this side. Um, so it's definitely something to look into more when we have results showing what we believe is the, the real arrival times along along the coasts. Um, the model doesn't say whether forcing people to come inland or or along it, and it would be interesting to see uh, how that compares to what we think the, of the archaeological record, the narratives that have been constructed. Thank you. Um, some questions on Zoom. Oh, maybe. questions on Zoom. OK, uh, I see a hand by uh... Let's start with uh, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm in Cambridge as well. Um, yeah, Judy, Judy Seeley's uh, point is, I think, a, a, a well-made one. Um, just for this audience, it's, it's quite interesting that um, we have some very early dates for relative to, to dates further in the interior for a ceramic type known as Matolo ware along coastal uh, Mozambique. And often these have been dismissed by uh, archaeologists working in the region as uh, somehow being, um, you know, uh, contaminated in some way or whatever. 
Um, and whilst certainly more dates are, are needed, the growing number of, of dates on Matola Ware from Mozambique you know, raises this possibility that actually there might have been an early uh, coastal um, expansion. And if we move further further north as well in, the, say, the Refugee Delta as well, Felix Chami's work there as well threw up some really quite early dates for um, early farming societies, or at least based on the, the proxy evidence of the presence of, of ceramics. So it, I think it's it's what what I find as an archaeologist really interesting about, about Alexei's work is that it is also helping us to identify uh, both areas where more intensive archaeological field work is needed to fill in gaps so that we've got a better record of, of sites, but also to, to look and see whether some routes were faster than others, not ruling out that there were other routes of expansion as well. So um, I just thought I'd chip that, chip that in for the benefit of this audience, who I know are, are mostly not archaeologists. Very nice to see you, Jim. You too, Paul. Uh, uh, Herman, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, so it seems that uh, introducing these correlations has shifted the dates later. Is there a systematic reason why that, th that is easy to understand why that would happen? So as but you were talking about our several dates down at the, at the bottom end um, being shifted. No, yeah, I... I understand the question. I'm just not a hundred percent sure right now because the the results are quite, quite recent. I still need to explore exactly why this is happening. I'm obviously a lot more comfortable with the fact that it has happened because it brings us more in line with what we we uh, believe to have occurred. Um, but other than the the model if, if i if we do a tactical simulation we're getting that the icon model is more accurate at uncovering true parameters than the Bayesian phase model in a similar way that i showed you the tactical simulation between the hierarchical and non-hierarchical model and we saw that the hierarchical was more accurate the the icar is more accurate so i don't have a but they were also beyond. systematically shifted against each other right you had, you had you had two dates aligned and they were both shifted yes yes but i can't tell you why exactly like mathematically yeah. exactly why that's happening um okay. other than it lo it looks from those simulations that would we're, we're going towards increased accuracy at uncovering true parameters about the archaeologists uh issues that they brought up do you see a chance of actually resolving uh, having even enough resolution to actually uh, grab grab a hold of this uh within your model Or how, um, how, sorry. Would it be, how much more data would you need? Can 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 you estimate that? Sorry, this is a typical <laughs> physicist, question, right? I mean, yeah. I'm going I'm going for how how can you nail down your error bars? <laughs> um, fair enough, but I'm I'm not even particularly sure that that would be uh, a useful way useful in this context because um the the archaeological dates that we have are are a result of a lot of hardworking archeologists that have worked for many years since the invention of radiocarbon dates in the sixties to, to get to um, what, what we have today. So it would simply just be a wishful mathematician sitting in a corner saying, if we had a thousand, thousand more dates, that would be great. Um, and there are areas where you do, like there are, there are lots more radiocarbon dates. Um, if you're looking at Europe or uh, Japan as your study matter, you have, it's, it's much easier but um, but what makes it interesting is to have all these empty regions, uneven sampling, et cetera, which is one of the reasons I chose to work uh, on an African phenomena, um, because the archaeological record here means that you have interesting statistical problems. Um, so I don't know, but I also don't know if it would be helpful to sit and dream as uh, what how great it would be if we had more dates. There is an underlying uncertainty in archaeology that will always be present, even if you had uh, 3,000 dates, um, 4,000 dates. Um, you're still going to have all those issues that the, all those factors affecting the data quality are still going to be present by the nature of the field. Of course, same thing as if you're trying to poke into the early universe beyond the CMB, right? 
<laughs> There's stuff that obscures what you can see. Okay, uh, so, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Um, okay, um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm from the physics department, so my question might be very uninformed when it comes to the archaeology. So you seem to choose these hexagon area squares essentially manually to all be the same area, how I understand it, to try and capture some localized um, movements. Um, is, is your model dependent on these areas all being picked manually with the same area being adjacent? Or can it also be possible to already try and use a statistical technique like some kind of cluster something to to kind of pick these localized or statistically find these localized areas or must they all be manually defined to be the same shape and area that's actually a very interesting question and it's not one that i've looked into yet but i have seen one previous study in uh, Japan where they used, so Japan is more sort of linear. It's, it's like longer and spread out than, than what we have, um, uh, than what we have here. And they use archeological knowledge to split a region into eight defined regions. And those eight regions are completely different sizes. Uh, they were where the archeologists working sort of believed a change would have occurred here, or they knew there was a mountain range, or they had seen a, a change in material culture, or they knew the rainforest. So they were building in their assumptions into how to split up, uh, so ah. in a very in a very manual way, more man manual than this, like more like drawing on a map how to split regions up. And those were the the eight regions that they used in their study matter. And it doesn't matter the the size of a region isn't taking it, uh, playing a part in the statistical model, and neither is uh, its shape. Um, what the reason I chose hexagons and standardized it all to be the, the same size is just because it's easier. But the the reason the shape is hexagons is because then you have more neighbors, then you have six neighbors, six six abilities to share versus um, a square where you only have, when you only have four four boundaries, four events to share. But what would be? I I do want to work more on that aspect. So the the dealing with more at uh, the minimal area unit problem. It I I dealt with defining the size. Uh, the area, how big it is, was it was at that threat as the threshold when you tend to increasing wouldn't get you, wouldn't let you gain any more information. You would start to lose it, but it would be interesting to do some statistical analyses to see whether this in fact um, is the most beneficial size or the most useful at capturing the specific local dynamics that we see in the study area. So it's not that it's not that it it makes any difference to the results per se that we might have like sorry here but i think your speaker being on is causing background interference all right if it is <laughs> sorry uh, or it might be on my side i'm not sure anyway it, it it's not it's not that we are losing um it's not that we're losing information by defining it this way it just it might it might if we do it a statistical way to define the shapes and sizes um might yield something that we didn't otherwise know existed in a lo in a local way so it's interesting to look to look up thank you for raising cool thank you cool. all right so any more questions from the the younger archaeology people, <laughs> or have we exhausted all the other questions? Okay, well, uh, let's uh, thank Alexis once again. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for the nice talk again, uh, Alexis. And, thank you.